Welcome, everybody, to the Living Your Career show. My name is Roisin Duffy. I'm a director at Blue Sky Careers. Our show is designed specially for you, the job seeker, the advancing professional. Our aim to give you confidence, to give you the tools so that you can back yourself professionally and progress your career where you want to take it. Our special guest today is Esther Kaitas. Esther is a board advisor, global HR leader, coach, author, and investor in startups, an executive of standing and an adventurer. Um, Esther, with her family in tow, um, has worked. Um, has worked for multinationals as far afield as the UK, the US, Europe, um, China, um, and the Middle East, Esther. I'm trying to keep up with all of them. She has also spent time working at home with, with notable blue chips like Downer. Um, she has also traveled from one continent uh, to country, to company, to culture. I can't imagine anyone better suited to talk about our theme today, which is about international careers don't just happen. And on that note, may I say, Esther Kaitas, this conversation is about 10 years overdue. Welcome to the show. It is, and thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Rasheen. Wonderful to be here. Esther, your motto is a bit like Richard Branson's. And you say, say yes to travel, say yes to adventure, and yes to career opportunity. And even though your and even though your heart might be over flooded with nerves, you can figure out the rest afterwards. Yeah. I love that sort of joie de vivre, particularly when it comes to career, so we don't limit ourselves in terms of our career aspirations. But I guess for many people listening to the show, they'll be asking the question, how did you actually identify what employers would want? What makes you tick? What you're good at? I, I mean, I think people maybe have make a better handle of that at home. But when you're applying for jobs overseas and you're based in Brisbane or, you know, even if you're based in London and you're applying for jobs in the U.S. or you're applying for jobs in the UAE, how did you differ differentiate yourself outside of your own backyard to blue chip multinational clients or employers, I should say? Firstly, being Australian is a wonderful thing. We have we are blessed with that wonderful Australian accent and we're blessed and we're blessed also to coming from a nation of hard workers and known to be travellers and explorers. So for me, it was very much um, being excited and curious about what the rest of the world was and, and who was out there and what they did, but also to... I guess the lure of the adventure, what I could do within my career to to meet new people and discover new countries and new opportunities. And it was a bit of a risk, but I felt being optimistic and my husband being optimistic, we thought we could we could give it a red red hot go. So it was all of that rolled up into one and and in the early days when we first started this adventure it really just did start off as an adventure and that's kind of wonderful too when you think about how we then plan a career around then plan a career around an adventure and discovering new people and discovering new cultures so it was a little less planned but more just around an adventure it's interesting because I talked about you tra transcending this planet with almost, it would seem, um, you know, almost ease. And but then I keep thinking, you know, the UAE, so in the last 10 years in particular, you've worked in the US, the UK, Macau, Hong Kong, uh, Canada. And I know one or two of those have been for the same employer, but mostly they've been different employers. Yeah. To many people listening today, do you, how did you overcome the professional the technical, perhaps some of those cultural nuances. Because when we read applications, we think, oh, they're going to fit in perfectly. I mean, I know, define what does fit in perfectly mean. But how did you in your applications, how did you in your approaches, approaches, actually overcome some of those potential barriers? I think it's about being open to the opportunity. And I think when you meet with recruitment organisations who are recruiting within the Middle East, for example, or even the opportunities within China, 
people meet with you and they say, you know, can you see yourself doing this? Have you done this before? Have you travelled? Are you interested? And I think I think really the first response needs to be, yes, I am. I am interested. I'm curious about the world and I have a family or a partnership that says, yes, they're interested in travelling as well too. So I think I think the intention and the keenness to be a part of something that's quite different, um, it's very attractive. And I think it's very attractive to an organisation when you go back and perhaps do some good research on what they do as a research, on what they do as a business, uh, where they'd like to go in terms of their business strategy. And you're engaged in, in being a part of potentially their organisation. And Along with that, you bring a good set of skills, you bring solid qualifications that that enable you to open the door to working overseas, but you have a great deal of enthusiasm about doing this and, and taking this adventure, but also contributing some good value in the profession that you're in. And that that for me, even when I'm hiring people and I'm sitting on an expatriate role in a human resources role, I'd like to see that people have done their research and have a sense of what it's like to move, not only as an individual, but what it's like to maybe work on a project overseas and maybe have the family stay at home, or what it's like to bring the family with them and the challenges of putting your kids into school, of putting your kids into school in China, or the challenges of when you go to work in the Middle East, ensuring you tie your hair back and dress very differently than you would be expected to dress in a corporate environment within Australia or England. So it's all of those things that that at the initial outset, you want to be able to show that you are up for this. It's interesting that you say that because I think that what you're saying is show that you've tested the waters at least. Yeah. So when you're applying for further work in that country, at least you can say, I've worked here for three months or six months and I had my feet on the ground. I had that sense of what the culture was about and I worked very constructively and did very well. Hence yeah. my application now to further that experience. I think it's also that thing, Esther, and I'll come to this in a minute, about if you're going to take your children around the world, you've done it in, as we said, different continents, countries, cultures, companies over the last, cultures, companies over the last 10 years. Yeah you sort of really need to know what you're setting them up for. One of the questions I think I had for you is Antipodeans invariably will head to London. We have a, you know, head to the UK, um, possibly even Ireland, in fact, or Canada. But I think more often than not, probably the UK. Do you think you have to be in the UK to use that as a launch platform for those bigger, I'm not saying we don't have big companies here in Australia, of course we do, and they have global reach. But do you find London is probably one of the better platforms for actually reaching out to those multinational companies? Or can we do it quite effectively from Brisbane? Look, my view is is we can do it very effectively from Brisbane. And it is different, and, and the times are different now in terms of technology uh, than they were when I started my adventure. However, uh, it is great to be or have been in these countries, even if you've travelled on travelled on an extended vacation, to actually know the city that you're working in. So for example, I work with a client in the UK and they're based in London and the Midlands and parts of Wales. It's very helpful when I speak with the staff and I'm working through a change and a transformation and a restructure. It's very helpful to understand in terms of restrictions and COVID, I've been there. I can actually visualise what it must be like. And it's different to sitting here in Australia where we are quite blessed in terms of our ways of managing the pandemic. It's different when I'm interfacing with folks in the UK. So to have that understanding and that empathy of having walked the streets, I think is important. However, I am quite successful. Whilst I do work a night shift, I'm quite successful in engaging Mm. with different organisations within the UK, parts of Asia, and even now, um, new now, um, new clients within the US. So that is actually going well, but technology is the key enabler. And that has changed my world. Uh, And I guess that's an interesting one because we're talking about COVID-19. And I was listening to a 
uh, 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 I guess, information from um, access economics. I think they're uh, mm-hmm. access economics, and they're very, very well known in terms of financial information reporting in terms of how the economy is faring. And they said, just as COVID-19 has dampened enthusiasm and dropped countries and economies to their knees, the resurgence will probably follow equally the other way. W- once the world is vaccinated, I'm sure there would be rules and regulations around that, yeah. you know, global employment will resume. From your perspective, where do you, uh, we talked earlier on, I think, you know, I think we're all saying at the moment, health tech is going to be huge yeah. in light of what's just occurred, perhaps agriculture tech, but perhaps agriculture tech. But I'm interested from your perspective, because your background is engineering resources, um, you know, energy, um, startups, and so forth. You've got such a a wide variety of influence, whether it's the startup and you're the investor or whether you've worked for the global multinationals and the big, in the big roles, where do you see the explosion of work potentially and the geograph, the the geographies that are going to accommodate that work beyond COVID-19? And look, I know you're not the big man upstairs and sort of predicting all of this, but I'd be interested given your global coverage, where you think that would might occur. Look, I'm very excited about edtech, education technology, and and I can't go past um, the fact that I'm the mother of of two grown teenagers who have been blessed with great educational experiences in, you know, six and seven countries around the world, But but I can't go past the fact that there are many people in the world who don't have access to education who don't have access to great education, Mm. and I believe that technology is the enabler. So I feel very uh, focused. I'm working with a UK organisation who is doing great things in EdTech for the Ministry for Education. So I can't go past the fact that I'm very excited about some changes and some enhancements in, in education, you know, certainly uh, healthcare and certainly the way in which we understand healthcare and how we interface with different countries and different demographics and populations is absolutely key. And when we look at things like vaccine distribution and we start to feel a sense of optimism about, you know, we may be able to move around soon, um, I feel excited about a number of things. But I do feel ex- but I do feel excited that we may be able to get out and travel again and we may be able to get out and do interesting things again. But I think it's important to stay focused around, yes, healthcare, education, access to medical care, vaccines, particularly in third world countries where it's simply a struggle to get the basics. So feeling more purpose-driven around the use of technology is really my interest and it's really where I focus my investments uh, to work with young people with exciting ideas who want to change the world. Climate also is another aspect which is very, very important and dear to my heart as well too. And there are a lot of great innovations and ways of communicating just great ideas using technology. So I'm optimistic and I'm excited about the future. Mm-hmm. When we were talking, how we, when we were talking, how we've known each other on and off, yeah. I guess around the blocks for a while, um, you hold great store in networking with people that you feel inspired by. You know, and I guess I'm quite interested because you're talking, people would say, but how do you even know where to find these startups? How do you even know who you want to approach or who you want to talk to? And I'm really interested in, I guess, the role that sponsors and networks have played in your career development. But not just that, how you know where to invest your time as far as your own investment um, options and decisions are concerned. So there's two things there, your career and as well the startup investments. And, and how do you get into that world to even know it? And um, that's what I'm curious about. Yeah, look, I'm a big believer after many years of trying to network and yeah. and and be able to and be able to network with senior people who might provide opportunities for me in the future. I'm a big believer in nowadays hanging around with people you like, people you're actually interested in. And if you think about it, and logically so, if you hang around with people you like, 
and you're talking about things you're interested or engaged in, you become quite attractive to them by way of discussion and interest and ideas. But you don't end up working for someone that fundamentally you don't like in a job that you really don't find very interesting. And I think that is sometimes the challenge for us. We're told sometimes as women, sometimes as young people, that networking is the key to your career success. And yet now when I reflect upon my career, the key to my career success has been around discovering and understanding my purpose and enjoying service and enjoying serving others and supporting others and working in the space of human resources and community development and communications. And and it's about It's about working well with others to achieve business and strategic goals that I believe in and certainly are aligned with my values. Now, if I just go and network with a bunch of people who are very successful financially so, I may find that I am not aligned with them from a values perspective. And henceforth, they may like my enthusiasm and and like you'd said in my bio and and my profile, wow, she's travelled the world. She's, She's very adaptable. Gee, she must be resilient. Absolutely, I am. But I want to be within an organisation working with people who are smart, aligned with my values, and then, frankly, you know, the sky is the limit. And and I think that, and and I think that, that in terms of networking, you can flog yourself going out to drinks all day long and all week long, but if they're not people you actually want to spend time with, I think you're wasting your time. Mm -hmm. I also think when you're in that sort of networking situation, it's all a bit of a facade. I mean, people now... And maybe COVID-19 has strengthened this. We want deepened relationships. We want mutual relationships. We want commonality in our relationships. And we want, you know, people that have our back and we have their back. And so if you identify the smart, the quality, the motivated, the people that can give as well as take, I think that's, um, you're definitely on a good wicket there. It's interesting, I suppose. um, Most people would say, did you start your career before the children? You know, did you head overseas and say, you're coming with me, kids, and we're going on this big adventure and we're going to travel the world. The mom is going to have a very, well, the mom is going to have a very, you know, successful career. And part of that is going to be this wonderful adventure for you too. Because a lot of people think when you're free to travel and roam, this freedom comes before children. But in reality, I'm, I think I was first introduced to you in 2010 or 2007 or something. And in the last 10 years, I mean, I was in China and you were in Macau and I never knew, so I didn't come to visit you. You know, you've worked in Texas and for the same company in Montreal, I think, in Canada. I think it was was certainly Canada. I think it was Montreal. And, you know, you've, you know, and then the UAE. And I'm sort of thinking, and I'm sort of looking at this and I think, you know, how did you know that you wanted to go to those countries that you could, particularly I'm thinking the Arab countries or perhaps China, which are very different cultures to ours. Um, and I'm just wondering, how did you sort of think, okay, kids, you know, you've put that, that notion of, well, you, you know, do it before the kids, because after that, you need more stability, but more stability. Perhaps you can tell me how you incorporated them into your thinking as, as you made these worldly decisions about your career. Look, I have to say that I blame this all on my parents. So this is all of my parents' fault. I grew up in a house... Uh, two uh, German, uh, Irish, English immigrants who came to Australia for a better life. But what they'd done is they'd posted this very large two metre by three metre world map up on the kitchen wall. And every day my mum and dad would shout out various cities, obscure places in the world, and we'd have to find them before breakfast. So we'd run around and we'd look through this map and we'd find all these places. And my parents were great adventurers and had different types of careers where they moved around the world chasing different types of technology and different types of jobs. So coming back to Brisbane, I grew up on all of these stories. So for me, stories. So for me uh, then travelling to the UK, there were a few things I was sure about. I wanted to get some more exposure around technology. And at the time, when we think about dot-com, Australia hadn't been moving as quickly as the UK and the US. So I felt that we could, you know, 
bung together a bit of a holiday, but also to get into technology. And, and everyone was looking for E something and E this and E that. And I put my hand up to this wonderful consulting organisation called Booz Allen and Hamilton. And I said, I can do that. I'll do that. And after five interviews, I was absolutely shocked. They said, absolutely, you're employed. And that sort of started me on a journey of, of working overseas but learning some really amazing, exciting things. And this consulting organisation had a number of interesting clients doing a number of interesting clients doing a number of interesting things. And my partner, Simile, was in a consulting and advertising organisation during .com and there was a lot of excitement going on there as well too. But this was all pre-children. So we worked all day and all night and we we achieved and we did crazy things at work like mind gyms and, you know, amazing things with colleagues to discover innovations. But the one thing I was really certain about is I did want a family and I did want children. Mm. And so that needed to be part of the plan. And that needed to be something that that both my husband and I tried to achieve. So that was just as important to me as having a successful career or learning great skills and having great experiences. And I think I think really the rest of it in terms of the adventures and the opportunities, I looked at them each case by case. And some of these decisions were not perfect. You know, we went through a great financial crisis back around um, 2008. That's right. And and there wasn't a lot of work in Australia. So for me, when I'd finished a project in China and looked at returning to Australia and looked at coming off an enormous $2.3 billion construction project with CIMIC, I thought, wow, there's actually not much going on back in Australia, going on back in Australia I think I need to be courageous, but I need to actually expand my ideas of where I go next. And interestingly, Qatar offered a wonderful opportunity in technology to establish a startup, the first commercial startup in the free zone in Qatar. And I thought, where is this place? I had never seen that on the map as a kid. I I know, it's going to be hot. (laughs) Yes, <laughs> and, and I, I remember I remember reading uh, even some of the information on some of the Australian websites, and um, and I remember reading that Qatar was not a particularly uh, safe place to go, and there was no Australian embassy, and if you needed to go to the Australian embassy, you had to sort of go overland through Saudi and go to Abu Dhabi, and I thought, oh heck. But it is such an exciting, but it is such an exciting opportunity, and it was an exciting opportunity. Mm. Here I was being involved with uh, people who had amazing ideas to transform a country that that you know only shortly had had been a country of Bedouins and goats and goat herders. And yet I was travelling to these amazing technology facilities, building data centres in the middle of the desert, and I'd have to stop the car most mornings for a herd of 200 goats and a goat herder to walk by. So it was just an amazing experience. And when I think about it, it wasn't easy travelling with kids. And I, I will be honest to say that I turned up at the school classroom with my young daughter she was about four, putting her into class and all of the children spoke Arabic and I had my sunglasses on and I was just tears and the Australian teacher came and grabbed and picked up my daughter who was clinging to me like a koala bear saying, I don't want to go here, I don't want to do this and the Australian teacher came and picked her up and said, we're going to have a great day. And a week later, I came back and she had a handful of Arabic words that she was running around, you know, running around the the playground, feeling quite happy and delighted. And it dawned on me that in actual fact, these moves were hardest on me and my husband and my two children essentially just got on with it and they got on with it. And my husband at the point of having children said, you know what? I need to take a career break. I need to reduce my hours and I need to put first the fact that we want this wonderful adventure, but I also need to support the full adventure. 
but I also need to support you to be able to do that adventure and to do these wonderful jobs that also support our family. So for us, we were going through some challenges as a family where we were essentially changing roles and and being Mm. in a non-traditional type partnership as well to Mm. be able to then enjoy taking care and raising a family the way that we wanted to raise a family but also to investing in my career and enabling me to be able to when needed travel to different countries work longer hours participate fully and yes be able to say yes to any other exciting opportunity that came my way so for me it was the power of that partnership that helped me be able to take my children also on this amazing adventure. I often wonder, you know, people um, working in engineering and um, working in engineering and construction and they have to to travel to, you know, to Africa or to Canada or, you know, even here in Australia, they've got to travel interstate or work offshore as the case may be. And I guess there is that thing that at least if you're in the country that you're working in or wherever that head office of those projects are and you can locate your children nearby, at least you're limiting the time that you're away from them rather than the fly in and fly out. I remember when I did my master's, I think something like 30% of the Australian workforce sees absolutely no issue with working and living away from home, which if you think about it, you know, when you're raising young children is a very challenging thing. It did occur to me, you talked a little bit about the crossroads and the turning point there about, yeah. you know, the, before you got the job in Doha, um, yeah. did, so the roles that you've got, was that your network giving you that insight or was it you doing your own investigation or how did you even get wind of, I mean, Macau and Hong, Macau and Hong Kong, you yeah. know, Texas, yeah. Yeah. How, how, how do you, yeah. how do you, how do people even know that you're looking for work unless yeah. your network is there and they have your back? Look, it, it's a mixture. It's a mixture and and I didn't and have never set out to, for example, my husband and I joke and say, if anyone had told us at the beginning of this journey that we'd be living in Texas, my goodness, we would have been shocked because that was never anywhere that had ever been on my radar. But I think through the course of the career and, and as you do one opportunity overseas and you do then a second one, people say, ah, she gets it. She knows what's it like to be able to work in in different countries. She knows what it's like to settle her family quickly, home, leases, cars, leases, cars, schools, and get on with it. And I think that's very important to be able to demonstrate that you are resilient, that you are optimistic, that you're not one of these people that go to China and say, oh, I don't really like the food or go to Qatar and say, I really don't like the fact that, you know, I need to, I don't know, wear sleeves longer than my elbows. That's That can't be part of how you operate. You need to be open, but also to respect that you're in a different country and a culture. And, and very much it is that chemistry and that ability to adapt that makes you an attractive candidate. You can come with wonderful qualifications, but if you think about it from this perspective, if you only last four to six weeks because your family don't want to settle or this is too foreign and they can't find the food they like to eat, it's actually an exp- it's actually an expensive exercise for an organisation to fly you over, settle you in, and then realise six weeks later that it hasn't worked. So I, I think from that perspective, you need to lead with, you've done your research, how this very much is part of your purpose and dream for yourself to be adventurous. And often when you go overseas, and like when I went to Qatar, these are startup opportunities. There is often nothing in place and you are starting from zero. So when you go to these countries, you can't be the sort of person that's pointing fingers and having others do things for you. You need to be the type of person that actually can roll up your sleeves, be very calm, even though inside you're terrified or nervous as to how you're actually going to achieve the challenge you've actually signed on for. But you do need to to do that with grace 
to do that with grace and do that with enthusiasm because that's why they've chosen you over others to come and, and take on this big, hairy challenge they've offered you. So, yeah. You said to me, um, not every job has worked out. And it's, you, I think you said to me, Roisin, so long as you know who you are, so long as you know what you're good at doing, so long as you keep your values, cl- you know, close, you can go from any country and work in any company, multinational or startup. But you need to know who you are and what you value. And I think it's kind of, you said to me, not everything has worked out. It's interesting for me. We, do, you know, I remember once being asked um, about uh, an appointment that was made here, and it was the media were ringing me and said, "What do you think of that, Roshi?" And I said, "I think it was a very expensive error, exactly as you've just described." But you, it's also important to manage your brand and reputation. So, how have you managed that? And so, how have you managed those difficult situations and those difficult conversations without burning bridges or damaging your brand? Yeah. Look, reputation. I'll start with this. Reputation is everything. Now, at the time, you may feel concerned in relation to, if I resign from this role, where is the next paycheck coming from? But back to your question before, how did you find these other roles? And for example, even the CIMIC role that I got in Hong Kong, someone had remembered working with me at a time that was very difficult within an organisation. And I had chosen to resign. And it was a difficult situation for that other individual. They'd since moved on and were connected with one of the key uh, decision makers at the CIMIC organisation. And back then it was Leighton Holdings. And they said, look, I don't know what this lady Esther's doing, but at a very difficult, but at a very difficult time within this organisation, she was graceful, she was fair, and a number of other just complementary ways in which they remembered me. That's about reputation. That's about how in the future people think of you. Because I don't believe that it is a good thing to stay in a job that you are not aligned with in terms of values or even particularly the leaders that you're working with. And things change within organisations. You may interview for an organisation, but three months later start to find out critical truths along the way. You may have a leader that steps out and says, Esther, I'm not going to stay here any longer. And then another leader comes on board and you have no shared values, you you don't have chemistry, but here you are in a role that you fear giving up because you don't want it to look bad on your CV, want it to look bad on your CV. And this comes back to what you were saying before. It is about knowing yourself. It's Mm -hmm. about being honest about why you left you don't need to go into warts and all that's not necessary but I think you do need to be authentic and say look it wasn't a match for me we didn't have values in common I saw the opportunity it was a great opportunity and I wanted to be a part of it but a couple of things along the way put me in a difficult position and I didn't feel it was the right place to stay long term so I made the decision to leave And I think always being graceful and always saying thank you for the opportunity and moving on is a good way to do it. Now, obviously, if we have a situation where there are serious inconsistencies or issues that cause you to resign, then yes, other decisions need to be made about decisions need to be made about being courageous and appropriately, particularly if you operate in the officer of a company role, reporting is required but Mm. I'm talking more generally when you feel that this is not the right place to be and although you don't want it to look bad on your CV I think it is best to draw a line and then move on now whether you choose to stay a little longer whilst you find another role so that you can continue to pay your mortgage and and be in a comfortable position, I think is, is is entirely up to the individual. But I do believe that young people, the best advice I can give to them is always have a nest egg of three to six months of your salary so that should this situation become real for you and it's not the right match or you're overseas somewhere and you need to bring your family home, need to bring your family home 
or ill health of a family member or ill health of yourself requires that you do need to leave, that you have that safety net because playing this game of career in a desperate way will only land you into another bad situation. And I don't think that, I don't think that's the best way to play it. I don't think um, that, that folks who play desperately or very quickly need to move on or get out of a bad situation make the best decisions. So for me, having that nest egg, having people around me to say, Esther, it's really not the sort of place that is aligned with your values. It's not what you talk about. It's not fulfilling your purpose. Having people to give you good counsel is also very wise as well too, very wise as well too. I have one final question. You have worked in so many places. I've been to some. I've never worked there. Perhaps as a young person, I dreamed of following in your footsteps. Is there one memory in particular that you could share with us that really espouses this whole thing about if you have the dream, if you want to travel, if you want to explore the world and do it with your career, is there one story that you could share that just stands out in your mind about something that really was and has has given evidence to your career plan, building an international career? Oh, Barashin, there are so many. There are so many. I look look this this memory is one and and it's a serious memory but it is one that has kept me kept me anchored to my purpose and anchored to really what I want to really what I want to do next when we talk about education technology and the value of being able to uh, provide access to people around the world to good education uh, for me, it's a story when I was in Texas and my daughter was in middle school and I came face to face with my husband with a active shooter school lockdown. And I stood outside the school with my daughter texting me from inside the school, telling me that everything's okay, but the alarm has been rung and they have been two hours with their hands around their knees being very quiet, waiting for the school to be cleared. And I thought to myself, I thought, right, where do I want to be in terms of my career and my family and what is important to me in the, to me in the next stages of my career? And, and absolutely, I love adventure and absolutely, I'm curious about people. But when we take it back to what is the most important thing to me, it was about my family providing a life that was safe and had access to good education and ideas. And now all of a sudden, this very confronting situation has happened. And I don't know what's going to happen next. And I guess for me, that very much shaped how I made decisions to leave the U.S., come back to this beautiful country and then even all of this prior to the pandemic have really had a good opportunity to sit back, reconnect with you and think about really how blessed I have been. And that's not from any perspective of perspective of financial or money or this or that, but it is coming back to at the core What is most important? My family, freedom, uh, living in a country that that is safe, all of those things. And knowing that there, for me, is a responsibility, not only for me, but also for my children, to serve others and, and use all of this wonderful experience and background and coming from this very lucky country to do good for others. And I think my next steps need to be about doing good for others and that's the way in which I invest my money within startups or how I invest my time with young people incubating ideas or even the technology that I look at in terms of the freedom of access for people who normally wouldn't have access 
So there's been a couple of mo- there's been a couple of moments where in my career I've said, "Wow, I brought my family to Texas, but now I'm taking my family from Texas, and I actually want something very different." So it's been exciting and it's been terrifying, but it has been actually bloody wonderful too. So rewarding. Yeah. Well, I can only say thank you so much for sharing your experience, your insight. I mean, those stories, you know, my mind was swirling as you were talking. Me too. Um, Unbelievable. And, you know, there's probably a book in there somewhere, Esther Kytus, I'm just saying that. Um, To our viewers and to our listeners, um, please join me in saying thank you to Esther. I mean, you've been amazing. And you and I will pick up on other themes down because there were so many themes we could have covered. And to the people who are listening to us, I'd just like to say goodbye from Esther and myself. Um, We've enjoyed sharing this time with you. And I guess... uh, And I guess uh, our shows run every Tuesday and Thursday, um, Brisbane time, 12 noon. Um, In the meantime, I think, strive to live your career the best way you can. Make each week count. Make each week count for you and your desires and your aspirations. And on that note, from Esther and myself, thank you very much, Esther. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And we'll be talking again.